welcome to Homecoming 2020 to everyone. Hello, some of you, I think last night, enjoyed the magnificent uh, talents uh, displayed at our coffee house or this morning, uh, academic lecture by Tara Dumas. So this is the first ever uh, President's uh, State of the University address. And it gives me a chance uh, to speak directly to you about some pretty important things going on here at Huron. And at the end of this, there'll be a chance uh, to ask me any questions you want. It was about five years ago, almost to the day, uh, when I flew to Toronto, rented a car, and drove to London for my interview for the job as principal of Huron University College. A couple of weeks later, I got a call, and I'd been invited back for the second round of interview. So Sarah joined me, and up we came again from uh, Fredericton, where we were living, and working at the time and shortly after that I got a call from the board offering me uh, the job and over those five years I have I think had the most fun I've ever had in my working career this has been a tremendous experience in a very vibrant community with a chance to make a real difference and impact in Canada and beyond first student I met that year was actually a week or so before classes started. His name was Gabriel Nidyashamia. Gabriel had lived his entire life in a refugee camp in Africa and came to Huron through the WUSC program, which sponsors refugees to be able to come and study at universities like Huron. And we went out for breakfast just the morning after he had flown in to Pearson. And over the next four years, I watched Gabriel develop and become a campus leader, taking active roles in all sorts of activities on campus and beyond. And this past year, Gabriel was accepted to graduate school at Columbia. We've convinced Gabriel to defer for a year and is actually going to be working with me on some important initiatives out of my office this year. Having met my first student, I also met my first faculty member uh, before I started work. And that was Dr. Neil Brooks. At that time, Neil was the president of the Huron Faculty Association. He took me out for coffee near our home in Byron to read me the riot act and tell me that as union leader, he would be holding my feet to the fire and uh, making sure that I upheld uh, the standards for which Huron had become famous. And imagine my surprise when a few weeks after that on scorching hot move-in day, who did I see helping parents unload their cars and helping students carry their gear into the residence but my union president, Dr. Neil Brooks. That was for me a foretaste of the commitment that I'd never seen before at any university I'd been at of faculty to the well-being of their students and the care of this institution. Fast forward ahead of four years when COVID struck this spring and uh, it was difficult for any of us to find uh, PPE and function. When two of our students from Beijing, Ray and Liz, and Liz, I recruited myself in a visit to China a couple of years before, showed up at our door of our house with an armload of masks, gloves, and gear so we could take them here on so our essential staff uh, could continue to work even as the campus was closing down. These are two students taking care of everybody else here at Huron. Well, let me just go back a little bit further for a minute or two, and that I think can help put in context what I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Huron, as I'm sure all of you know, opened in 1863, and it was to be a place for the training of men for the Anglican clergy. And in particular, it was to be a, an antidote to a particular kind of Anglican churchmanship that was then prevalent in Toronto. And so it was a pretty narrow mission and vision, but even then there was hint of a broader perspective in the appointment of its first principal, Isaac Helmuth. Isaac Helmuth was a man who had come to the West, having grown up in Poland and educated at rabbinical school before becoming an Anglican, uh, an Anglican clergyman arrived in Canada, had a distinguished scholarly career, worked at bishops, among other places, uh, and then was invited to be the first principal of Huron. He was, as I say, a scholarly person, a person who had grown up in Europe, multilingual, having experienced two different religious cultures, and bought a breadth of vision 
to this new institution. And he would go on a decade later to be the first chancellor of the new institution, Western University. Well, after 90 years, many of them were here on tottered on the verge of financial ruin. It never seemed to have sufficient funds to operate comfortably. Huron made a series of gambles in the late 1940s and early 1950s. It decided to build a new campus and then expand into offering degrees in arts and social sciences. And as a consequence of that, no longer restricted to simply preparing men for uh, training in the Anglican church as ordained clergy, it admitted women. All of these decisions, the new campus, operating arts and sciences, and admitting women were both visionary and good, and keys to the future growth of Huron. And this was followed by the long principalship of John Morton, under which many of you were here as faculty, as staff, and students, and saw Huron both grow and stabilize itself. And now, here in 2020, I'm proud to say that Huron is poised to mark a new and exciting chapter in its history. Over the past three years, Huron has led every Ontario university, actually every university in Canada, in growth. In September 2017, three years ago, we enrolled 252 new students in first year, and we had 850 students in total. Last month, September 2020, three years later, we enrolled 520 new students and had 1,555 students in total. Our first year class doubled, and our overall enrollment has increased by 83% in just three years. Our students are drawn now from across Canada, and while Ontario remains the largest market for Huron, we now have British Columbia coming up fast in second place. We have students from the prairies, from Alberta, Ziana Kutadia, our tremendous new HUCSC president, came to us from Calgary. And 30% of our enrollment, full 30% of our first year enrollment this year, is comprised of international students. And our international students come from some 30 different countries, literally around the globe, North and South America, Europe, and Asia, and Africa. We're tremendously proud of the students that make up our student body. And all the while, we've been raising our academic standing and our academic standards so that once again, Huron is tougher to get into than Western, and our admission standard is now at the very pinnacle among Canadian universities. While doing all of this, we've also been rebuilding our campus. Many of you will have seen and perhaps toured the beautiful new Alumni House, Lucas Alumni House and Apps International House, made possible by generous gifts from Rick Lucas and Alfred Apps, respectively. Our new Wellness Center is located in the previously decaying and now proudly restored Young House. The venerable Bruff House, known all, to all of you, is next up for restoration. And I say that just in case any of you have your checkbooks handy. As for the rest of campus, every other building, every other space, from the residences, to the libraries, to our classrooms, to the green space, has received attention, leading to an altogether brighter, more welcoming, and more usable space now for our students to learn and flourish. And finally, we're set to move into our beautiful new $20 million academic building next month. This will be the most significant addition to our campus since here I moved to our current location 65 years ago. Seven new state-of-the-art classrooms, new offices, a proper welcome center to greet visitors to Huron, a spacious and bright student space, complete with a performance stage, and yes, a bar. Finally, a magnificent new 450-seat performance theater. This will open Huron not only to London, but to the wider world beyond. We intend it to be a place for performances, for concerts, for debates, for public speakers, for all forms of community engagement, so that Huron can be true to its mission to serve the world. Many of these spaces have been sponsored in the new building by various Huron alumni. Classrooms, seminar rooms, even the president's office, 
Sarah and I paid for that one. All will be revealed to you soon. There'll be opportunities to tour, and we'll be announcing an official fundraising. Still, there are many other spaces and opportunities for any of you who want to put your name or your family's name on something important and something lasting. In the coming weeks, we'll be making a major announcement about our future. This will be the first in a series of significant advances for Huron over the next two years, not the least of which will be the appointment of our first Board of Governors, following the passing of a new Huron Act, which is currently before the Legislature of Ontario. All that's happened in the last three years, this tremendous amount of activity and growth, has really been built upon all that was achieved here in the previous century and a half. Things that you achieved and experienced, but things also that you helped build in the time since your graduation. And I want to thank you for all you've done that have made possible what we're doing today. I have complete confidence that the next era for Huron, upon the cusp of which we now stand, will see this grand old institution become the premier undergraduate university in Canada, one that has a unique calling and mission. We're really serious about developing leaders with heart. And I see the fruits of this vision every day in the lives and works of our faculty, our staff, and our students. And once again, this builds upon Huron's long mission of having a goal to do something that's concerned with more than merely the bottom line, to do something that is concerned with the human good and the world beyond. In these COVID times, we've learned that there is an awful lot we take for granted, all of us, things we're used to doing that we just assumed we could always do and we can't do anymore. But more importantly, and I think far more positively than that, I think we've learned to focus a bit on what's really important. I believe we've got a chance to hit the reset button and reorient ourselves, both individually, I certainly have been conscious about trying to do that in my own life, and realize what an opportunity this is to reorient uh, my own priorities. But I think we can do also that as a society with the goal of becoming a more compassionate, a more humane society, one that's built upon a solid foundation of care for others. My mom and dad had no money and little formal education. I've got a picture of them behind me on the mantelpiece and anybody who's ever been in my office, I've told you about them. But without money and education, they were nevertheless people of great compassion and character. And they taught me and my siblings, not through speeches, but through their own behavior, kindness, generosity, care for others, forgiveness, and love for their neighbor. We want our students here at Huron to have these same guiding principles in their lives. And we want to be deliberate in instilling them not merely be value neutral and giving an academic education. We actually care about the character of our students and want to encourage them to be the kind of people that this institution was built to serve and to produce. Huron has a tremendous responsibility, but I believe we also have a tremendous opportunity. The state of Huron, as I speak to you today, is tremendous stronger probably, well, unquestionably, than any time in its long history. But its future is even more auspicious, thanks to the wonderful team and thanks to all of you that make Huron the place it is.